What is up, everyone? This is Pete Characters Clark, and welcome back to the Carrot Poker Podcast. This is episode 83, and we're getting nearer to the launch of my new book, Mental Game Book Poker Therapy. Really um, stoked now, guys, because since we last spoke, I have created the cover for this book, which is like a picture of the Jack of Diamonds. He's the most troubled card, of course, that goes through the most tilt issues and needs the most therapy, lying on a therapist's sofa while the Queen of Clubs, the ultimate therapist, um, gives him some counselling. Um, a lot of people have said to me, why are you a queen in the on the front cover? And I was trying to explain to them that I'm not meant to be depicted by the Queen of Clubs. It's just meant to be like a typical therapy session using cards, get it, poker therapy. Don't take it so literally, guys. I don't see myself of the queen of, as the Queen of Clubs, okay? But anyway, it's Friday afternoon and I'm in a good mood, so I figured I would try and always record these podcasts on a Friday afternoon, Scenes Plus EV, and today I would bring you some snippets and tidbits and sneak previews from the book. It is finished, as in the first draft is completed. Um, I've started the editing process, which for me doesn't take very long because I'm just kind of like, yep, nailed it the first time, nailed it the first time, no more you can say there, Pete, well done. That's a bit long-winded, but they'll just have to deal with it, that sort of thing. Um, no, in seriousness, I do make a few changes, but I'm not one of these authors that goes through and completely dismantles everything just to rewrite it again. I try to get it close to right the first time and to spend a bit of extra time in the first draft and then sort of go through and edit. So that's the stage I'm at, but less about the boring protocol of writing and more about the content of this book and how it's going to help you guys have a way stronger mental game, improve your bottom line at the tables and enjoy poker more. Poker Therapy is a mental game book. You don't need much technical um, knowledge to benefit greatly from it. What it will do is it will seek to let you see that why why you as a human are poorly wired for poker, like how different the alien world of poker is to the world of real life and because you're a human being that has evolved and grown up in real life um, and you've got many of your genetic traits from ancestors who have done the same, you're not really designed to thrive in the world of poker and for that reason that's why we find poker such a mind-blowingly annoying game a lot of the time that's why we behave so illogically and rationally emotionally at the tables um, I'll give you a little bit of a quote from poker therapy from the introduction of poker therapy before I get into today's topic which is going to be the different types of misfire different ways that the brain goes wrong in the mental game at the poker table but I'll give you a little bit of a quote from the introduction about exactly what this what this book is about um, so it starts off by saying many poker players fail simply by ignoring the necessity to work on their mental game. They leave massively harmful habits unchecked and let their emotions dictate their fate. Congratulations by purchasing this book. You have avoided the first hurdle. Now let's get to work. That's my way. That's my hook trying to set the scene. Um, so poker players often talk about going on tilt, a word that immediately conjures images of angrily throwing money into the pot or childishly berating opponents. But that covers very little of the subject matter of this book. Poker Therapy is a book about the poker player's tendency to malfunction in a variety of ways, glaring and subtle, sudden and gradual. Instead of talking about tilt, which I feel limits the scope of mental game exploration to outbursts of a dramatic and intense nature, in this book I discuss the many common ways in which the human brain goes wrong in understanding and reacting to poker's challenges. The struggles I cover belong mostly to the domain of the mental game. So this is basically just the book in a nutshell. We're not talking about like really extreme tilt. We're not talking about blowing up and shoving 8-4 off suit preflop or anything remotely of that nature. What we're talking about is just the many ways in which the human mind tends to misfire. So mental game leaks or mistakes that happen at the table. In this book, I will describe, I, I call them misfires and I go into various categories of misfire in the book. And in chapter three, we actually talk about the different ways in which the human brain misfires and that's kind of a prelude to chapter four where we start listing and busting some misfires, learning how to rewire the brain to avoid these mental game pitfalls. But what we're gonna to do today is talk about the types of misfire that the human brain is gonna be subject to and how these can hold you back at the poker table, how to identify them, recognize them, see them as the brain misfiring. Um, I wanna just get into a little bit more detail about the word misfire and what I mean about it in terms of poker's mental game. By misfire, and this is not me quoting, I'm now rambling, if you can tell the difference in tone here. Um, by misfire, what I mean is basically, well, now you can definitely tell, because now I'm like, um, what I mean is basically, 
So Misfire is about the brain doing what it's supposed to do in real life, but doing it in the realm of poker where those things no longer work. Hopefully that makes sense. So to give you an example, in real life we're very used to looking at how a hand... We're looking, looking at how a situation plays out for us. If a situation has good results, we're very likely to think that we did something right. For example, if we go to a job interview and the interviewer says, oh, well done, Pete, you really impressed me today. I'm going to offer you the job. You look like a really impressive candidate. I look forward to working with you. I'm going to be like, I nailed that interview. Bam, everything I did, did there was good. And when I go for another interview for a promotion in two years' time, in some al alternative universe where I actually have a real job, um, I'm going to use a lot of those same ideas and presentations and professionalisms and what whatnot, whatever you do in the real world of people wearing shirts and ties and blazers. Um, I'm going to do those things again because they worked for me the first time. Poker is very much, you know, that parent that kicks you. Kicks you is a bit extreme. Um, hits you. I don't know. Bit, bit, bit overboard there, Pete. But hits you for doing something right and praises you for doing something wrong. For example, in poker, you could go on till and shove a strike suited against the three bet because you're sick of this guy three betting when that's a minus EV investment and get it in against Ace King and hit the jack and win. Um, maybe that's a bad example. You're probably less likely to think that that's going to be something you should repeat. But maybe you just make a bad call and run into one of the few bluffs that your opponent has in his mainly value heavy range. And because you've won against one of those few bluffs, you think that you know you get positive reinforcement from that on a conscious level and a subconscious emotional level. And you're more likely to then call River in a close spot like that again or a spot where you are torn between calling and folding, even though that spot is actually a clear fold and calling is very bad for your green line, your overall win rate in the long term. So that's what I mean by misfire. When, when someone is doing something wrong based on the way that their brain is wired to in real life, but that happens not to work in poker, but the player has not yet rewired their brain for poker. I was originally going to call this book, not seriously, but I was pondering calling it rewiring your brain for poker. Someone said to me, please don't call it that, Pete. That's far too long-winded and ambiguous. Give it a better name. So I was like, poker therapy, bam, done. Anyways, let's move on to talk about the types of misfire that are prevalent in the poker world. And this is an extract from chapter, actually chapter two, I said chapter three earlier. There's an introduction, which is like chapter zero, if that makes sense. So I'm gonna to talk to you guys today in this podcast about six different types of misfire. So again, misfire just being the brain working in the wrong mode for poker, but these are processes that would probably work quite well outside of poker. So misfire means we're doing something good, but we're doing it in the wrong realm. We're misfiring that thought process, even if it's a good thought process in real life. Hopefully that makes sense. So type one are survival misfires. So a quote from the book here to give you guys a little bit of a taste. So these are mental game mistakes that arise from instincts to avoid danger. Originally, we evolved three reactionary states to deal with direct threats to our lives, our loved ones, or our possessions. We deployed fight, flight, or freeze to keep us safe from predators and, of course, our fellow man who is often intent on killing us for our resources. A little bit of, like, backdrop there that is probably not too relevant to the topic of this podcast, but you get the picture. These are... Survival misfires are things that are based from our innate reactions to fight, flee, or freeze in response to a trigger. The way poker therapy works is that every single misfire we look at in this book and that I'll talk about today is going to have a trigger. That's going to be an external world thing that causes you to run a mental interpretation process. Now, the mental interpretation process that you run in response to a trigger is basically your way of perceiving or interpreting or making sense of that outside world thing that's affecting you. So in poker, it could be something like this player instantly three bets me for the second time in a row. Your subconscious automatic interpretation could be, well, you're full of shit. I hate you. You're aggressive and I want to beat you for all your money. That could be like a flawed interpretation that runs and then that could cause the response of fight, which causes you to four bet instantly um, without any proper justification, without any good blockers to his continuing range or anything like that. So that would be an example of a survival misfire. It has a trigger, it has an interpretation that is basically interpreting the trigger as a threat to our prosperity or welfare, and then we have a reaction, a, what, what I call a response process in poker therapy, which is our way of logically reacting to our interpretation of the trigger. 
So it goes trigger, interpretation, response. And poker therapy is all about the idea that it's not the trigger that we can change. We can't change the fact that someone three bet us, that's going to happen. Nor can we change the response because once we've run an interpretation of something as being a threat, it's only natural to respond in that way. So the root theme at the very backbone of poker therapy is that we should try to change our interpretation only by seeking to modify our interpretation of the poker situation can we see it in a way that does not naturally lead to a flawed response program such as a survival misfire such as fight flight or freeze and i've got some examples of survival misfires in this book let's talk about a few of my students but first off to reiterate a survival misfire is when we have a trigger that's not a threat we have an interpretation that perceives the trigger as a threat to us and then we have a three-way fork in the road where we can either flee because we feel revolted or afraid or anxious we can fight because we feel offended insulted or enraged or we can simply freeze and our brain can shut down and we just have a confused blank expression on our face as we stare at the screen and in which case when we freeze we'll feel shaken or startled or dazzled or bewildered or blank in the extreme case so yeah it's very possible that when the brain is forced to compute a complex puzzle under time pressure that it is just going to freeze up and i have a few students that act that act in that way when they face a difficult or intimidating spot that's perceived as a threat so let's talk about a few of my students let's talk about tom to start with so tom i quote here tom tends to revert to flight and try to fight fight not flight in situations that his subconscious mind interprets as threatening especially when aggressive regulars we all hate them right who represent attackers take aggressive actions against him the reasons he feels threatened are to do with his own insecurities about his skill level relative to these opponents by adjusting the belief that he is fragile and likely to be outplayed or bullied by these people tom could interrupt the danger prescribing part of his survival misfire and avoid the following scenario the following scenario is a diagram figure five which is an example of a fight misfire and in figure five, we have villain raising the turn. So Tom is like, let's say, C bet flop, C bet turn. If you're listening to this, Tom, you know who you are. Um, and then the turn gets raised by a villain after Tom has made the turn C bet. And the interpretation that Tom runs of the trigger, villain raises the turn, is the interpretation that the villain is trying to bully Tom out of the pot. He is attacking me, he is bullying me, he is trying to make me fold. In some cases, this can take the form of the misfire called I don't believe you, where the student thinks that the villain is trying to pretend that he has a certain hand in order to bully Hero out of the pot. A very natural and common way of interpreting a situation, given our real life conditioning about people trying to con us or trick us or, you know, pull the wool over our eyes to take things from us. We, there's loads of fraud scams, things like that in the real world. We're very skeptical of people saying that we should give them money or surrender the pot. It's the same thing. So that vulnerable, offended interpretation of the spot leads Tom to the fight impulse, which causes a thoughtless and emotional turn shove or an equally thoughtless and emotional turn call. Folding is not ever taken because, let's face it, the option was never on the table in the first place because when Tom interprets the turn raise as I'm being bullied, he has very little chance of doing that. So a survival misfire is all about the student trying to react innately to a situation based on a sense of danger um, and I think actually today's podcast is going to be called survival misfires not types of misfire so there we go I've now changed the name of the podcast halfway through the podcast because I just realized we're not going to get through the other types today they're going to be stories for another day so let's focus on this one today so the problem here is not that the turn bet being raised is, is an issue nor is it the brain's use of the fight response as a remedy to a perceived threat. So the problem is not the turn bet and it's not the fact that we are acting with fight in response to a horrible, lying, bullying attacker. I think fight is a very good way to handle a horrible, lying, sneaky, bullying attacker. The problem is the middleman, the interpretation that sees villain in the first instance as that horrible, deceitful, bullying criminal. So because we see him as this guy that's like coming after us and trying to take stuff from us, that's why we run that interpretation so the way that tom needs to rewire his mind there is by using the process recommended later on in poker therapy I'm not going to give it to you guys for free um to basically change that interpretation into something different 
it's a four step rewire process and that is chapter four of this book or chapter three depending on how you want to count chapter zero so that's fight um i've actually tom is a real person i've worked with tom um and i do use different names for most people in this book but this one you're gonna know who you are um so tom and i spoke at both length a great length about how to do visualizations in order to see the spot differently and i can report that thanks to techniques from poker therapy tom is now no longer seeing his opponents as horrible vindictive bullies every time they try to bet or raise or value bet this is most commonly the case at tom stakes like 25 and l i think so yeah like that doesn't happen an awful lot in those games people are not trying to raise you as a bluff on the turn after you've already bet twice at 25 and l online very often so yeah, another way it could go is fight. Sorry, flight. I keep mixing these up. We've done fight. So now on to flight. Um, another st student here, um, I'm going to call her Rachel, um, has struggled with flight misfires for a long time and tends to interpret aggression as a sign of frightening strength. So not quoting any longer. Now I'm just rambling. So basically, Rachel's idea was that whenever somebody takes a strong looking line that their hand or range is very intimidating and very strong and that's just a case of seeing yourself as naturally weaker than the thing that the adversity that you're facing whereas tom was kind of empowered by this and felt defiant that he wanted to smite his opponent for the insult to his pride of raising the turn rachel feels the opposite she feels like and this is a real student as well um Rachel feels like the player, the opponent, is actually just very, very unsurmountably powerful and unfightable, basically. Like, what would you do if a fly attacked you? You'd probably fight it, right? You wouldn't run away from the fly. You'd be like, right, 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 fly, let's go. Round one, ding, ding, and then you would, like, kill the fly, and you would be the victor. And that's why your brain selects fight. When a fly goes into your face, you select fight. You lazily swat at it and you kill it however if a bear jumped through the window into my office right now i guarantee you i would not choose fight that would be a terrible idea that'd be like calling down with seven high don't have any claws or teeth i've just got stupid little human limbs so what am i going to do i'm going to try and run away with my silly little human limbs and vacate the premises as quickly as possible might even try and jump through the window from whence the bear came if that was the fastest route out of the house Never mind my girlfriend downstairs, we'll just leave her to distract the bear, shall we? So, so anyway, better be careful I'm not speaking too loud here. So the point here is that our interpretation process, the thing that runs from the trigger, that precedes the response, which is like the angrily mashing the call button or fold button or whatever, that middleman, that interpretation, is basically the thing that governs how we react. So while Tom's interpretation was trained from his real life instinct to fight, Rachel's is trained to flee from her instinct to flee. And it's very likely that both Tom and Rachel actually express mirroring um, tendencies in real life. It's very likely, for example, that if Tom was confronted with a danger in life, another person trying to take advantage of him, he would react confrontationally, whereas it's very likely that rachel might try to avoid the situation one thing i've found by working with people over many many years now is that poker players real life wiring and in-game wiring is almost the same all the time so you can look at how you react to certain situations in life and you can probably gauge where you're going to be on the fight flight or freeze scale based on that so rachel's very much on the flight end tom's on the fight end but both of them both of these things are problematic at the poker table because both of these things lead to suboptimally chosen actions. They lead to both students pressing a button not based on logic, but based on trying to justify their desire, their drive that's motivating them via emotion. But the drive of fight or flight doesn't just motivate us via emotion it also uses a very tricky sneaky mechanism that i talk about quite a bit throughout the course of poker therapy a mechanism that i've coined pseudo logic pseudo logic i'm not quoting here i'm just trying to like paraphrase is the brain's attempt to satisfy the poker player's need for logic to be governing situations 
And it does this in a situation where, in reality, emotion is pulling all of the strings. So let's take Rachel, for example. When she's in a situation where she sees villain raise the turn and her first experience is the flight instinct and wanting to vacate the pot just like I want to vacate the house from the bear. I um, really hope a bear doesn't come into my house right now. Like, she's going to... She's going to do that. But she's not just going to admit that she's acting out of that emotion alone. So, so Rachel's thoughts here, or inner sort of monologue, um, self-talk, is not going to go... I am feeling very afraid, so I better fold. Why is it not going to do that? Because that would be an admittance that emotion was pulling the strings. That would almost be an admittance of being on tilt and were conditioned from a very early poker age, so to speak, to not want to do that, to not go on tilt, to want to make decisions like a cold calculating robot, not like someone that's just, you know, being controlled and thrown around by their own emotions and desires. So what does Rachel do? to try to justify folding. Well, she posits some kind of thought process that appears on the surface to her lazy conscious mind that's kind of quiet right now, not really engaged. It's more the subconscious that's running the show right now. But she posits some kind of thought process to her conscious mind just to satisfy its appetite for logical decision-making. So that thought process could be something like well, if he's able to do this, then I'm going to have to fold. Or just something like, people will always have a strong range when they do this. He's never bluffing. Such so things like that. And she will do this not just in spots like this, where the person probably isn't bluffing much. Like I think in this spot where you double barrel and face a turn raise at micro stakes, you probably should fold most of your bluff catchers. But Rachel will do this in spots that are actually clear calls. She'll invent reasons based on pseudo logic to call uh, sorry, to fold, or even call instead of raise when she has a really strong hand, that justify that flight impulse, that desire to flee, that sound a little bit like logic, just to satisfy the, the conscious mind, which craves reasoning. And when the conscious mind is scared because of all the emotion it's experiencing, it will settle for some very patchy reasoning in order to make the decision that satisfies the emotion. So when Rachel folds, she feels relief, she feels positive reinforcement, and therefore, given that she knows she's going to feel that, she doesn't need very convincing reasoning to fold. However, in order for her to continue and call that turn raise, regardless of whether it's right to do that or not, she would need a lot more of a convincing argument because the desire is very much pulling her in the direction of fleeing slash folding. So that is what I have to say about flight. Okay, on to freeze. So freeze is basically a very strange kind of reaction. To make sense of what freezing is in life, in human evolution and behavior, I think it makes sense to imagine that I am now cornered by the bear. The massive giant bear is like far too big and powerful and razor sharp claws for me to fight. There is no escape because if I try to run away, it will just catch me because there's nowhere to go. So the best defense here, and I'm pretty sure you're not meant to do this against bears. I think this is actually a very bad argument. Um, you know, speaking as a zoologist or someone, which I'm not, my girlfriend is, so she'll be able to tell me this. But I think against a bear, you're meant to like pretend you're really large and put your jacket out to pretend you have wings like a dragon and, you know, shout at it. Be like, hey, bear, I'm going to kick your ass. And the bear's like, oh, shit, this guy's confident. But let's say that that wasn't going to work and fight wasn't going to work and flight wasn't going to work. It may well be that the best defense is just to lie there completely motionless and hope that that bear either doesn't notice you, forgets that you're there because animals are pretty stupid and kind of tend to forget what's happening a lot of the time. Like my dogs can look at something and then the next minute forget that it was there. Pretty silly. But hey, who are we to judge? Um, and then the best response for me in that situation would probably indeed be do nothing because I want that bear to leave me alone. I wanted to think, oh, this is an unworthy piece of prey. Or I wanted to think, oh, that thing's been dead for ages. I'll just leave it alone. Or I wanted to think, oh, there's nothing there because I'm a silly bear. So freeze is a good thing to do when you need to have no action, no activity, nothing going on in your mind or your body. Therefore, when a student doesn't feel like they can successfully fight 
or successfully fly, or they're just too confused, they don't know how to react. Another time that freeze works in nature is when we have no clue what to do. So we freeze so that we can try to bide time so we can figure it out. So in the example where the student gets raised on the turn, we're gonna to move to another student now, let's call him Martin, who freezes when adversity happens, when he faces the turn race. Why does that happen? It happens because Martin doesn't have any way of making sense of the situation. His skill set's not sufficient yet to give him an immediate answer. And his misfire here, his survival misfire here is that because he's interpreted this situation as like unsolvably complex and difficult and just really mentally intimidating, instead of trying to fight or flight or even be calm and logical, his brain just freezes because it doesn't know what to do. It's like startled, bewildered rabbit in the headlights like why do the deer freeze when they run into the road because they have never seen this bright light stimulus before and they don't know what to do i think again i'm not an animal biologist don't quote me on it or animal psychiatrist i think that's why they freeze because it's an unknown stimulus they've not got a rule or heuristic in their deer brain about oh bright light equals car that's going to smash me up because you know cars are not an evolutionary factor um, about whether deer were able to pass on their genetics. Eventually, perhaps the strongest deer will be the ones that recognize headlights as bad and run away. But for now, the reason they freeze is that it's an unknown stimulus that's threatening. So when a poker player faces a line that threatens and baffles them at the same time, freezing is very often the go-to solution. It's not a very good solution because it disables mental processes that you need to work to solve the spot, but it's an evolutionary solution nonetheless. So I'm not going to tell you how to fix these things yet. I'm just outlining the scope of this book and I hope you find this a little bit interesting and I hope it kind of persuades you to check out poker therapy when it comes out. Date-wise, I'm looking at the first couple of weeks in November. I'd like to think by about the 15th of November the latest poker therapy will be available to buy on carrotcorner.com, also on Amazon as a Kindle book. I will say though, buy it on my website, carrotcorner.com as a PDF email me saying that you've done that and I will ship you a free um, dot .mobi file, Kindle file for you to upload onto your little Kindle and, and sit and read that wherever you want. But buy the PDF because you gotta look out for the little man, right? So yeah, so Martin's problem with freezing is that he has all this unusable energy but he has nowhere to go and he just panics and the brain just shuts down. There's no thought process. Um, so I've said here that treatment for Martin, just as a sneak preview, will be twofold. He'll need to work on the root cause of the problem, like his brain has to form alternative neural connections which interpret the ramping up of complexity, so the difficult, puzzling poker scenario as a solvable challenge, because only when something seems solvable or we can understand how we might go about solving it, can we get the gears going again and get the sort of treadmill conveyor belt going and start running mentally, so to speak, and be able to solve that situation. If we can't get going, we will completely freeze. We will just stand still and we'll go nowhere. Um, but also, you know, the very thing he needs to get going is the thing he lacks. So because he actually um, doesn't have the capacity to do that yet, he's gonna have to work out of game. He's gonna have to train his mind using out of game drills that sort of emulate in game conditions somewhat and stuff like that in order to have a good enough thought process to get started in the first place. So there's definitely some out-of-game work needed here and there's some in-game therapy needed here as well. There's lots of poker therapy needed in Martin's case with his freezing. As with Rachel and her fleeing, as with Tom and his fighting, all of these students, in summary, suffer from evolutionary inherited um, survival misfires that are very common in poker because poker is a game of resources. Resources used to be everything they were intrinsically linked to survival. If you didn't have food, you would die. Nowadays, if you don't have money, you will die in some places in the world. It's the same kind of thing. You're not gonna have a happy life. You have to protect your resources. So our brain subconsciously knows that money is resources and resources are survival. And that's why when these things are threatened, we react in that way. Even if we're playing without money, even if we're playing a game like bridge or chess, or some other game like backgammon, we will still, even if we're not playing for money, view winning and losing as winning or losing a fight to the death. Maybe not consciously, but in some weird subconscious part of our mind, 
we're running similar scripts, maybe lesser magnitude, emotionally speaking, but similar scripts that we would run if we were in a fight to the death in a gladiator pit or whatever the hell it would have been in the old, before times, olden days, where you have to fight in gladiator pits all the time. It was just what you had to do, like, every day. So, yeah. I hope you guys have enjoyed the sneak preview. This is a very, very tiny extract of poker therapy that I've given you here. The book is about 150 pages. There's lots of different misfires in there that are results of not just feedback misfires, but other types as well. So today we are going to talk about mis about feedback misfires, sorry, survival misfires, but we're going to talk about the other types of misfire in future podcasts. We're going to give you a sneak peek of other areas of the book where we actually look at specific misfires and see how to rewire them. We're going to look at student case studies. We're going to look at roadblocks, which are more permanent character flaws that can hold people back and how to treat those. We're basically going to do therapy on your poker game. If this sounds like something you want to get, carrotcorner.com, get the PDF, email me, I'll send you a Kindle version. And yeah, I just look forward to hearing you guys' feedback. If you want to come on the Carrot Poker Podcast, email me please, admin at carrotcorner.com, add me on Skype as characters, whatever you want, just get in touch, let me know you want to be on the show. I've got a few more interesting um, guests lined up for the near future. I'm going you know, to look forward to bringing you guys those episodes. And in the meantime, to tide you over, I still have products on my website, The Grinders Manual, a good intro to the game that you definitely want. Every six max player should have a copy of that, no matter how advanced it's like the Bible. In my biased opinion, 100 Hands, which is a follow-up example hand review book. And also we have Pio versus Population on there, which is a little gen gentle e-magazine intro into how to use a solver to destroy the competition by seeing how they don't play optimally and exploiting it. So lots of stuff on carrotcorner.com. Do check it out, do get in touch with me, and I will see you guys for episode 84 soon when we're probably gonna either have a guest on or if not, I'm gonna talk more about another part of poker therapy. Hope you enjoyed today's episode and I'll see you guys at the tables. Bye-bye for now, thanks for listening.